instead of saying, hey, this is what I have to offer, learn about your client, learn about what they're doing. And you know, at that point, you're going to know if you're going to be able to actually, like you said, serve them. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Conner. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Conner, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority. Well, today I'm so excited to have my guest join me. He actually has already raised over $115 million in private money, and he's going to share with us right here in this episode how he's going about doing it. Well, first of all, with over 20 years of real estate expertise, my guest actually began his journey all the way back to when he was 21 years old. That's when he acquired his very first single family rental. And while at the same time he was pursuing degrees in biomechanical engineering, can you believe, and finance at Virginia Tech. Now, since then, he's navigated many, many different kinds of real estate ventures, all the way from development and private lending to syndicating over, as of today, over one and a half billion dollars in commercial properties ever since 2016. Well, he lives in one of my very favorite places on the planet, and that's Asheville, North Carolina. In just a moment, you're going to meet my very, very special guest, Mr. Christopher Larson, right after this. Well, hello, Chris, and welcome to Raising Private Money. Jay, great to see you again. How are you today, my friend? Great to see you as well. So excited to have you here on the show. I know your backstory, but my audience does not know your backstory. So first of all, how about share? How in the world do you go from an interest in biomechanical engineering and finance to real estate investing guru? Yeah, Jay, thanks for thanks for asking that. And I love that question because so often, you know, after spending 18 years in the medical device space, people are like, well, how did you transition, Chris? Like, when did you transition? And when I was in when I was in school, and I'll share, I'll share my story. And then if if you're listening today, if you're watching today and you want to get a copy of my book, you can go to uh, nextlevelincome.com and there'll be a little book link there, and you can put your address in, and we'll even send you a hard copy here for free. And I'll tell you all about my story. Um but really before I was, I was studying biomechanical engineering, before I was interested in real estate, my number one love was racing bicycles, Jay. And I started racing when I was 14 and actually just wrote a, wrote a little, um, kind of story to, to honor my friend, um, that I met, um, geez, it would have been, uh, I think it was 1993. So we're talking about, you know, well over 30 years ago mm -hmm. now at this point. Um, became my best friend. His name was Chris. We started training together every day. Um, and I, I raced, I did okay. My first, first year, second year, I won the state championships and really fell in love with the sport. And I went on to, um, race, uh, the junior Olympics and, um, raced at the multiple national championships, raced in college. I was actually all American my sophomore year in college, but between my freshman and my sophomore years, that friend of mine, his name was also Chris. His name was Chris Strader. He had a massive brain hemorrhage and passed away on June 21st. And this is this shows just a few days after that date. And that's why I was writing um, about Chris because of that. And I went back to school, raced my bike. I was still studying engineering, but I'd already decided I really didn't want to be an engineer. I wanted to be a professional cyclist. But after racing that following year and really using cycling as my therapy, I realized it, at a point kind of towards the end of that, that summer season that it was kind of silly racing my bike. I really didn't feel like I was getting everything out of life that I could get. So I came back to school. I quit. My team went pro. I gave up that dream, sold all my bikes, and I just kind of went back to uh, life at life in college and, and was just kind of a, what most people look at being a normal college student. But something had really changed in me, and that thing that had changed was that 
I was determined not to have any regrets. And I wanted to honor the life that I had and the life that my friend Chris did not have. And you know, one of the realities in the world is that you you need financial resources if you really want to live life on your own terms. So I had that that kind of epiphany. I said, okay, like I want to I want to live life the way I want to live it. I took an interest in um, investing. Actually, the same family friend that got me into cycling introduced me to the stock market. That was Roth IRAs were fairly new at that point. Learned everything I could about in, investing, and actually I. I started as a day trader in the stock market and I was making like $5,000 a month as a junior in college. But I'll tell you what, Jay, when you're laying in bed as a 20 year old at 3 a.m. and you haven't slept all night, you learn real quick that that's not investing. And that was the that was the um, next epiphany I had was that, you know, that's a job. And I, was, I said, OK, what can I do that's really going to give me true freedom? And I read over 250 books, got that MBA in finance, um, which I'm proof of over there on the wall. And I decided that real estate was going to be my path. So I decided at the age of 21 to be an investor first and foremost. But, you know, when you're 21 years old and you don't have a full time job, you're still in school. Now, I was completing my MBA. I was working for Virginia Tech to, to pay for that. I was working for State Farm in the nights and weekends, and I had a real estate license. So I was, you know, doing three jobs plus going to school as well, getting my MBA, having a great time doing it. And I was just learning everything I could about money at that time. And when I ran out of money after buying my first couple properties, I said, well, what, what can I do to, to make enough capital to, to continue on? And I was introduced by the State Farm agent I worked for to a gentleman that was in the medical device space. And he actually sold hips, knees, shoulders, orthopedic implants, the same implants that I studied getting my biomechanical engineering degree. I thought, this is this is really cool. And he's telling me he gets to go into surgeries and this this sort of thing. And I said, his name was Alan. I said, well, Alan, let me ask you, like, how much, how much money, you know, did you make last year? And he tells me, now this is, you know, going back, you know, 25 years. He said, well, I made $300,000 last year. And I said, how can I do that? Because I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and Robert Kiyosaki said, you need to be accredited. You need to make $200,000 or more have access to the best investments that were out there. So that's why I pursued that path of biomechanical um, or I'm sorry, um, orthopedic or, or medical device sales. And I did that while saving as much as I could over the ensuing uh, 15 years and investing as much as I could. And you know that's how I kind of built up our passive income for our family. So I ultimately didn't, didn't have to do that anymore. And I decided to walk away um, we had started syndicating deals in 2016. And it was interesting because you know you have a lot of conversations with clients, with customers when you're in um, you know a sales space, especially if you're going into surgeries. You spend a lot of time with these people, and I, I got a lot of questions from surgeons. They said, "Well, what do you do, Chris? Like, what do you invest in?" And then as, as we started out these conversations, they'd start to ask me, "Well, hey, can I invest with you?" So my first partner and I did a JV partnership with the group that we were investing with in 2016. We bought a hundred property, hundred unit apartment property um, or multifamily property, which most people know as apartments down in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And since then we've, we've done uh, about 4,000 units in the multifamily space, self storage. Uh, we have 20 mobile home parks. We also have 31 express tunnel car washes actually on a car wash right down the road here in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, hotel, got some office space, um, residential developments. You mentioned the private lending. So we've ventured into several different areas as we've kind of built out our portfolio over the past decade. Well, that's wonderful, Chris. You've got such a variety of uh, different types of real estate that you've been involved in. So you've just got a lot of experience that you can share. So as we started out the show, I uh, let everyone know that uh, you've already raised in excess of $115 million in private money. So you've got quite a bit of experience in raising private money. So let's dive into that a little bit since the name of this show is Raising Private Money. Absolutely. Uh, what are your favorite ways to raise private money? Yes. Um, so I think, you know, there's, there's kind of some different steps. That, that you can look at Jay. And, you know, I, I do some, uh, I, I, uh, I'm a coach with a group 
where we help others as they kind of go through this process. And you know, you have a fantastic show. You've been on our podcast as well, um, so you know it. So I think you know if you're starting off and you're raising you know a small amount of capital, you don't have to get fancy. You know, you, you talk to these gurus or you join a coaching program, and people tell you, oh, you gotta you gotta have a podcast, you gotta write a book, you gotta be on social media, you know, you gotta do all these things. Well, I'll never forget. When I first got into sales, I was selling Cutco knives back in uh, my, my spare time um, in, in um, summers during college. And I would sit in the back room of my parents' house and I had a little smiley face drawn on a sticky note. And that smiley face would remind me to smile before I picked up the phone and called that next potential prospect to set up an appointment. And I did the same thing when I was with State Farm in college after that, you know, in my, doing my grad degree. And I, I kind of did the same thing when I was with Pfizer and then, you know, making, making sales calls, um, with Medtronic and, and other companies that I work for. And the bottom line is you just need a, a list of potential people that are, are a good fit for what you're looking to do. So whether that's selling Cutco knives or a medical device implant, or whether it's finding a potential partner that can, um, provide capital for a deal that you're working on. So, you know, I think step one, Jay, is put a list of people that may have interest. You need their name, you need their phone number, and you need their email. And pick up the phone, make a phone call, have lunch with them, have coffee with them, sit down. I think, you know, in today's world, we get too caught up in technology, and technology is amazing. You can use that to leverage things. Um, but the first thing you need to do is really build your network, know your network, and have conversations with your with your network. And you know, an easy conversation would be, "Hey Jay, you know, um, you and I have, have known each other for a long time. We've talked over the years. You know, I was telling you about one of the real estate deals I did. Um, you know, we're, we're actually working on a project coming up. I want to see if you had any interest in that. Simple yes or no question, right? And at that point, it opens the door to have further conversations and do that. So I think that's my favorite thing still to this day, Jay." is is just picking up the phone you know i still do this not like this like you know young people too right because this we used to have the the dial rotary phones when i was growing up um and have those conversations and um that kind of gets into into my next point which um but i'll pause there sure uh well hold that next point because i feel like yeah. i got a question yeah. um i tell people all the time that carol joy my wife and i we've got 47 private lenders right now that are investing yeah. in our real estate deals. And interestingly enough, I never have ever asked them for money. Uh, I've never pitched a deal per se. And people say, well, Jay, how in the world do you go about doing that? And I mm -hmm. said, well, it's, it's real simple. I do what I call, I put on my teacher hat, my private lender teacher hat. Yeah. And I began just leading with a servant's heart and leading with education. Yes. You know, interestingly enough, not one of our 47 private lenders ever heard of what private money or private lending was until I shared it with them and told yeah. them what it was and how it works. They never heard of self-directed IRAs. Over half of our private lenders are actually, you know, using their retirement funds that they had and they moved it over to a self-directed IRA company. So I, I advise real estate investors that have never raised capital before. From my experience, the very first thing to do and to get right is your mindset. I tell people Absolutely. it's it's hard yep. to own real estate until you own the real estate that's between your ears. And Love that. what I yeah. mean by that, uh, what I mean by that is first we got to get it straight. We're not begging, chasing, selling, persuading, trying to talk anybody into anything. We're simply, instead of asking for money, we're offering an opportunity. And, you know, the traditional way to borrow money is you go to the local bank, get on your hands and knees and put your hands underneath your chin. You say, please fund my deal. And you got to fill out an application. Yep. And, you know, Mr. and Ms. Bankers got to look under, look at, under your skirt at your personal assets to see if they're going to loan you any money based on your financial statement. And the way we raise private money, and you too as well, Chris, is um, we are actually offering an opportunity. There's no application process. I mean, right. you as the borrower, you're already approved. So right. that's the first thing people, in my experience, have got to get straight. What have you noticed since you've worked yeah. with some other folks to, to show them really how to go about raising 
capital. What are some of the mistakes that you've seen new capital raisers make and that uh, people should avoid? Yeah. So first off, Jay, you know, I, I mentioned that smiley face, which is, you know, like you said, you, you got to like smile before you have a conversation with people, you know, your energy really life's an energy game. Your energy is going to determine, you know, your success. And, and like you said, you're offering an opportunity. I'll never forget when I first learned about syndications, I was like, how have I never heard about this? Which really drove us towards our mission, which is to really help others you know, find opportunities for financial independence, but also educate them. Like you said, Jay, you know, and that's where the podcast comes in, the book comes in, um, you know, shows like, like yours are so wonderful at doing that as well. And like I mentioned, when you talk to somebody, you don't say, Hey, here's what I'm doing. You say, Hey, is this, is this something you're interested in? People are like, well, yeah, like I've never heard about this before. Right. And why would they not be interested in it? If it, if it had, um, you know, some benefits. So when, after you have those initial conversations or you say, hey, somebody is, is, is aware or interested in what you're doing, you know, the first error is it's kind of a corollary of when investors look at a deal, they look at the returns. Um, the first error in sales that I find when I went in to sit down with surgeons, they'd say, hey, Chris, what do you what do you have to show me today? And most reps would say most sales reps would say, hey, this is what I have today for you, doctor. Look at this. Look at this cool pen. Right. Um, look at this cool product. That's the wrong way. The first thing you do is you say, hey, Jay, thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Just love to learn a little bit about your goals. What are you looking to do, right? If you sit down with a customer, a client, with that doctor, for instance, I'd say, hey, doctor, what, what are your goals for your practice? What are you doing today? You learn about what they're doing. Then you learn about the issues they're facing. And potential investors are going to say, well, I'm looking for, in, you know, I'm looking for steady income. I don't like the stock market. I'm looking for less risk. You know, I have, I have a child with, um, you know, with, with some, uh, you know, learning challenges and I want to make sure I set them up with, with some assets, you know, after, after something happens to me or, or before something happens to me, um, I want to spend more time with my children and I can't do that with, um, you know, my current plan because I wait to I have to wait till I'm 59 and a half or I can't, you know, I'm, you know, the stock market is, 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 is too volatile. I don't have enough passive income at that point. You're going to determine, you know, whether what you're doing is, is going to be a good fit. And then you can share with them, you know, potentially, you know, what, what that is going to be, like you said, Jay. So again, flip that instead of saying, Hey, this is what I have to offer. Learn about your client, learn about what they're doing. And, you know, at that point, you're going to know if you're going to be able to actually, like you said, serve them. Chris, that reminds me of advice I heard a long time ago, and that is, Jay, instead of trying to be interesting, be interested. Interested. I love that <laughs> saying. Yeah. Love um, that. Uh, you were going to make a point a moment ago. Did you make that point yet, or did, or did I um, throw you back to it? <laughs> I don't know if I did, but I love that's that's a great that's a great way to underscore what I said in a very concise way, Jay. Excellent. Well, let's change gears, Chris. Yeah. One of the areas that you really understand, you make it easy to understand, and people have heard this phrase, but they really don't understand it. So I want to give you the opportunity to explain in simple terms because you're good at it. What is the infinite banking concept? And why should people learn about how to leverage that concept? Um, I appreciate you bringing that up. I think it's fantastic. Um, you know, again, it's, you know, a lot of things I do are kind of, kind of contrary to conventional wisdom. And, you know, just like we were talking about sales, don't start with the product, you know, start with, start with your customer. Um, I really like the infinite banking concept, which is really a specialized insurance contract. It's a traditional whole life insurance contract, which some people are like, oh no whole life insurance, you know, that's, that's crazy. Um, my father died when I was five. I know, I know what it's like to have, you know, a need within our family and do that. So I think, you know, having, having a protection, if you have a family, if you have a spouse, if you want to leave a legacy, I think traditional life insurance, there's nothing that's more predictable than that. I have a, a my best friend, he, he employed this strategy and three years after he did that, his wife passed away at the age of 40. Um, Tragically, she was in the in the military and, you know, people will say, well, it's not a good investment. And I would say 
life insurance shouldn't be viewed as an investment. It's a tool. And when you use it with what's called infinite banking, the infinite banking concept, or like on our website, if you click on the banking link, we talk about the investment optimizer. You can actually use it in conjunction with your investments. So how would that work? If, if you're looking for a place to store your money between deals, so let's say they're waiting for your next deal, Jay, and investors looking for that, and you know someone wants to invest you know, $50,000 a year, they can actually store that $50,000 within their life insurance policy and get a rate of return. Typically, the rates of return, right now, they're around 6%. And when they get an opportunity to invest, they can then actually take the cash value out of that policy and invest it, and you get an arbitrage factor in there. So we, we teach and work with our investors and our clients to match up their insurance strategy with their investing strategy. And we started our policies. To, it's always easy for me to think. It's my, We did it a year before my son was born. My oldest son is 14. So 15 years ago, we started our two policies. And we did those to actually as an alternative to 529 plans for college planning, because we knew that we would have and this is not something you hear in real estate, but we hear or investing, but you get a guaranteed rate of return. So we would have a guaranteed amount of money that would be available to our children when they went to our two boys, when they went to college. And then we started using the cash value in those policies to be able to leverage that. Now, if this strategy is new to you, the way to think about term and permanent or, or whole life insurance is like renting or owning a home. When you rent a home, it's cheaper. It's typically about 30% cheaper to rent a home than own a home, but there's a lot of advantages to owning a home. You have um, you have control over that. You have predictability. You're not going to, you know, probably not going to get kicked out because you're land you have a landlord that decides they're going to sell it or raise rent or do this and that. Um, but what's nice is when you own a home, you have a fixed mortgage payment typically, right? Over say 15 or 30 years and whole life insurance is very similar. So it starts out more expensive, but over time, as your rent goes up, as term life insurance policy rates go up, your whole life stays the same. But the thing that really allows this strategy to work, Jay, is the same thing when you own a home. Let's say you buy a $500,000 home and put $100,000 down. You have $400,000 of equity. Well, if that home goes up in value $100,000, you now have $200,000 in equity. And you can tap into that equity through a line of credit. You can do the exact same thing with a life insurance policy. So some of your listeners may actually be shaking their head up and down saying, oh yeah, I've actually used a line of credit to invest with Jay and, and or invest in a project or maybe even do your own project. And you can do the exact same thing with life insurance. And if you blend the strategies together with the infinite banking concept, you can actually increase the overall returns of your portfolio. And you know the way we structure these policies is so that these policies, these um, uh, uh, life insurance policies actually pay for themselves within the strategy. And we actually have a book that you can uh, you can pick up here. You can email me at chris at nextlevelincome.com. It's called Money Insights for Sales Professionals, but the strategies in here can be used by any high income earner to do exactly what I just said. And you can also learn more with our webinar at nextlevelincome.com forward slash banking. Again, Chris's yeah. uh, website is www.nextlevelincome.com. And for goodness sakes, there's all kinds of resources there uh, to help you become more financially free and get you on that pathway. Uh, one last topic I'd like to just yeah. touch on uh, before we begin to wrap up, Chris, and that is you're not only in real estate, you are diversified. Uh, in fact, you mentioned at the beginning of the show that uh, you own car washes. In fact, you own a car wash right down the road from uh, where you are now. So why is it that you're investing in cash flow businesses like mm -hmm. car washes uh, in addition to real estate? Yeah, great question. And you know, I think a lot of times people see what we do and they're like, oh, it, it's all real estate. And I really think that car washes should be viewed like you, you perfectly described it, Jay, as a cash flow business. So as you build your financial base, let's say you have, you know, your life insurance, you have your, um, you know, your, your, um, emergency fund, you know, all your, your base plan, you have your cash flow investments with, with Jay, you, you maybe have started to, to build out your passive income and you've been doing it for a few years. I found that a lot of investors like to layer in 
some other options that are out there that may give one diversification, but also give potentially higher um, rates of return as well. I think when you're investing in businesses, you should certainly expect a higher rate of return. One of the things that we like about car washes is, is that you have a lot of the same aspects of real estate. You have income, you have the ability to add value, you have depreciation along with the, the ability to increase appreciation. But with our strategy, as we build up um, our portfolio, as we layer on more car washes, the value of the total portfolio goes up. So what I mean is the, the multiple with which we can sell the portfolio may go from say 10 to 15 as we go from 10 to 50 car washes. So as you build out that portfolio, it's a private equity model, it's a roll up model. And as you do that, you're able to add more value to that. We have about 150 uh, members on staff with our Hurricane Express Wash. You can check us out at hurricanewash.com. You can see all of our locations there. Um, if you're interested in learning more about these as an investment, you can click on the invest link at our website and check that out. Um, but it's certainly, it's been an area that I've been interested in for uh, nearly 10 years now. My uncle and I almost bought a car wash about 10 years ago. And as the opportunities um, started to present themselves, we started to um, bring in investors and syndicate these projects as well, Jay. Chris, you've brought so much value here to my audience and to the show. Um, final comments and final reminders that you'd like to give the audience as to how to connect and all those wonderful um, uh, pieces of information they can get, yeah. the books you've got. You've just got a, a boatload of information that you can share. Remind everybody of all that as, as well again. Yeah. So if you're, look, if you're on your journey towards building your passive income streams, please check us out at nextlevelincome.com. Um, but also if you are working to build your investor base and you're looking to raise private capital, you can kind of steal my model. Check out my book, nextlevelincome.com forward slash book. Um, you can you can get a copy of the book there, but then you can see our communications afterward and kind of see how we work with investors. And like you said, Jay, we take an education forward approach. So um, take a look at our book, take a look at our website, take a look at our podcast as well. Everything is available on the website there. And if you have any questions and I've kind of spurned today, um, feel free to reach out to me directly at chris at nextlevelincome.com. Again, that's C-H-R-I-S at nextlevelincome.com. Chris, thank you so much for your time and thank you for joining me here on the show. Jay, always great to see you. Thank you, sir. Same here. And there you have it, my friend, another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. I'm so glad you decided to join us. And be sure, if you are watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss out on any upcoming notifications of our shows. And if you happen to be listening on, on one of your favorite podcast platforms, iTunes, Spotify, or any of those, be sure and follow me so you don't miss out. I look forward to seeing you right here on the very next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's j-c-o-n-n-e-r.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.